Good afternoon. I'm Frank Mecklenburg, Director of Research and Chief Archivist of the Leo Beck Institute. And I welcome you all to another exciting event. And for new listeners, uh, Leo Beck Institute is one of five partner organizations of the Center of Jewish History, uh, together with YIVO, dealing with Eastern European history, uh, the American Jewish Historical Society, the American Sephardi Federation, and the Shiva University Art Museum. And we are all united in one catalog system and one reading room. I also wanna briefly mention our format. First goes the author, um, then the commentators to follow, um, then the author and the commentators will have a brief discussion amongst themselves. And then we open to the Q&A. And please place your questions into the Q&A button um, on the bottom of the screen. And um, then our sort of um, moderator uh, will maneuver and, and field the questions. So first we have the author, um, Douglas Morris is the author of Legal Sabotage, Ernst Frankel in Hitler's Germany, which was published last year uh, with the University of Cambridge Press. He is an attorney, an active attorney with the def Federal Defenders of New York. And he also holds a PhD in modern European history from the University of Rochester. His previous book, Justice Imperiled, is about another German lawyer. The subtitle of the book is The Anti-Nazi Lawyer Max Hirschberg in Weimar, Germany, which was published by the University of Michigan Press in 2005. And we have our two commentators. Uh, first goes uh, Claudia Kuhns, who is the Peabody Family Distinguished Professor Emeritus of History at Trinity College of Arts and Sciences at Duke University. And in her book, The Nazi Conscience, Kuhns examined public culture during the so-called normal years of the Third Reich, that is between 1933 and 1939. And she showed how the Nazis built a new, call it perverse ethical consensus and identified the key role of popular racial science and expert opinion in convincing mainstream Germans that Jews, homosexuals, Roma, also known as gypsies, were inferior and alien. And in her current research, Kunz asked similar questions about contemporary European reactions to Muslim women who wear the jihad, hijab. And the second commentator is David Abraham, who is a professor of law emeritus at the University of Miami School of Law. Before going into law, Abraham had started out as a scholar of German history. He is the author of The Collapse of the Weimar Republic, which examined the conditions and fate of efforts to establish a viable welfare state. More recently, he has written on immigration and citizenship law with a particular focus on citizenship in a neoliberal era and problems of social solidarity and integration in Germany and Israel and the US. And I give the word over to Douglas Morris. Thank you, uh, Frank, for that uh, very uh, uh, kind introduction to all three of us. I'm really delighted to be here and to be with uh, three people uh, who I admire so much. 
Uh, two of those people are our commentators, Claudia Kunz and David Abraham, who are two of the most exciting uh, intellectuals that I know and nicest people that I know. So I want to thank them right from the get-go for uh, joining us. And the third person is Ernst Frankel who I also care about quite a bit and found an extraordinarily exciting intellectual and uh, courageous person. I began work on uh, Ernst Frankel when I was, thought I was writing a book on Jewish lawyers in Nazi Germany. And I came across Frankel in that context um, and he really caught my attention. And let me give you one example of something that caught my attention. On April 8 of 1933, soon after the Nazis had taken power in Germany, he had to respond to an ordinance requiring Jewish lawyers to apply for readmission to the bar uh, and to acknowledge the present existing situation as legally binding. Frankel did not ask uh, for readmission. He asked for a continued admission and then added, as for the statement, that I acknowledge as legally binding the provisions establishing temporary impediments to being a lawyer, I refuse because I do not recognize those provisions. Uh, this was a man who I really thought needed uh, further attention. It wasn't that people hadn't paid attention to Frankel before. He actually has been studied uh, quite thoroughly by scholars of the Weimar Republic uh, in, in Germany between the end of World War I and the beginning of the Nazi era, when Frankel was a leading uh, member of the uh, Social Democratic Party of the trade union movement. He was an up and coming lawyer uh, for that trade union movement and dealt with the constitutional issues of the Weimar Republic. And scholars had dealt with Frankel after World War II when he returned to, uh, ultimately returned or eventually returned to West Germany and uh, developed the theory of pluralistic democracy and became and it helped to invent the field of political science in Germany. But there was a gap in between uh, the Weimar Republic and uh, post-war Germany, uh, which was Frankel's uh, career in Nazi Germany uh, between 1933 and 1938. Um, and those were in fact the most exciting and dramatic years of Frankel's life. He was Jewish, he was a Marxist, a social Democrat. He uh, represented political defendants in court. He worked in the underground and he wrote a major classic titled The Dual State, which was the first full length analysis of the Nazi legal political system written from within Nazi Germany and analyzing that political legal system in a way which is compelling and uh, until this day. So when I came across Frankel, I asked myself questions such as, what did Frankel do while he was in Nazi Germany and how did he do it? And in the course of asking those questions, I doubled back and asked myself, did he really do what he seemed to have done at first glance? And if so, how did he survive? And I saw that the investigation of Frankel and the study of Frankel during Nazi Germany was really a study of anti-Nazi resistance. Uh, anti-Nazi resistance has been studied uh, extensively during World War II in other parts of occupied Europe when people rose up against a foreign oppressor. Uh, it has been studied extensively um, uh, within Nazi Germany during the Second World War, culminating most uh, dramatically in the July 20, 1944, plot against Hitler's uh, life, um, which was a, a resistance which involved elites and uh, some members of the church, members of the military, uh, including members of the military who had a, earlier engaged in genocide. But here was a uh, opportunity to dig deeper into the resistance in pre-war Nazi Germany, a time when the victims of Nazi Germany were Jews, were social Democrats, were communists, were people with little institutional support, uh, were people who were subject to humiliation, and nonetheless, they resisted the regime uh, with quite a bit of courage. Uh, and one of these uh, people was Ernst uh, Frankel. 
Uh, in terms of his political representation, uh, he practiced law. He represented defendants in court. He was able to continue to practice law because he was a World War I veteran, regardless of what he had said in that earlier application. He represented people who were charged with treason, uh, people who were charged with having uh, being members of the Social Democratic Party after the Nazis banned it, with people who were charged with uh, distributing illegal pamphlets. And in the course of representing these people, uh, he even got acquittals of people. I've been asked whether I thought of his representation as a form of cause lawyering, the idea which I strikes me as a post-war idea of lawyers, uh, especially in the United States or elsewhere around the world, of using the courts in order to advance particular uh, political causes. I don't see him as having been a cause lawyer because the German judiciary was different from the American judiciary today. During the Weimar Republic, uh, it was a right-wing judiciary which uh, could ease its way very easily into the Nazi era. During the Weimar uh, Republic, uh, there was uh, political justice and criminal prosecutions. And uh, in, when there were civil uh, litigation uh, which involved political justice, it was mostly libel cases. Frankel in Nazi Germany um, uh, was dealing with political crimes. And while in the Weimar Republic, there was uh, also a whole realm of non-political justice with lawyers who uh, engaged in sensational trials, which gained, gained a lot of publicity. That was not the nature of legal representation in the, uh, under the Nazi regime. Uh, in uh, representing political defendants, uh, Frankel had to basically put on non-political uh, defenses. He could not uh, engage in publicity. He was not a person who could did or could in that circumstance engage in self-promotion. He was in fact quite self-effacing, but he was tactful and he was not cowardly. Uh, he knew that, for example, he could never mention that the Nazis had set the Reichstag fire, even though he represented people who were prosecuted for having said that. But he did challenge the factual assertions made against his clients. He challenged confessions obtained through Gestapo torture. Uh, and um, in that regard, his um, uh, representation was remarkable, it was courageous, and it had some success. But all the time, while he was representing defendants in court, he also worked in the underground. Uh, he, as a lawyer, and I had mentioned that he was not really, in my view, at least a cause lawyer, uh, although he certainly was a lawyer who had a political orientation and was committed uh, to uh, social democracy and to the trade union movement. He acted as an independent professional while he was uh, in Nazi Germany. He acted independently of groups. And in an ironic way, that meant that he was in contact with more resistance groups than anybody that I, else that I can imagine or have come across. In the beginning of the Nazi regime, the resistance groups were usually small, um, scattered organizations. Uh, Frankel represented members of those various groups. Um, and as he was able to take advantage of his contacts through that representation and his former contacts from the Weimar Republic to uh, report abroad about Gestapo torture and also to write underground pamphlets and to uh, which criticized the Nazi regime and analyzed the Nazi re regime. He was engaging in exactly the kind of conduct that many of his clients were being prosecuted for. In 1935, late 1935, he wrote a remarkable essay entitled The Point of Illegal Work. And I think there's probably a point in any a book author's uh, presentation when the author wants to reach over to his book, which I've just done, to read uh, what I find one of the most dramatic passages um, in Frankel's writings and from this uh, essay. He closed it by saying, yes, we have become criminals. If we were not empowered by our illegal activity, I fear that we too would sink into the smog 
that oppresses Germany. Because we work illegally, we keep ourselves fresh. That is the point of illegal socialist work in the Third Reich, to infuse the workers with strength, the waverers with trust, the sufferers with hope, and the rulers with fear. Does illegal work have a point? What would Germany be without illegal work? 1936 uh, was a turning point in Frankel's approach to the resistance. And it was a turning point in particular in a case called the Delatovsky case from July, 1936. It came at a moment in which resistance groups were uh, being utterly crushed when more and more cases were going into Nazi established courts from the regular courts that Frankl had appeared in to, to Nazi created courts like the uh, infamous People's Court. Um, and at a time, in fact, when Frankl was facing more, more and more illegal uh, anti-Jewish discrimination as a result of the uh, Nuremberg laws from back in September of 1935. In this Delatovsky case, essentially what happened is that a uh, former cremation society uh, had, been, uh, had been subjected to Gleichstaltung or enforced Nazification. Um, and the issue arose uh, whether uh, former employees of that cremation society uh, could get severance payments under a collective bargaining agreement. Uh, and Frankel represented them, appeared in court, and won. Uh, soon after he won, the Gestapo seized the cremation society's assets uh, and all the money that was owed to the dismissed employees. So this uh, procedural success collapsed into an ultimate failure. Uh, and at that point, Frankel had an epiphany or as much as, uh, as an epiphany as the Jewish atheist, social democratic Marxist lawyer can have. Uh, but it's at that point that he uh, came up with his theory of the dual state or a double state, a state which consisted of arbitrary power and a Nazified legal system, or perhaps better said, a Nazifying legal system. Uh, there was arbitrary power when the Gestapo dissatisfied with the judicial decision could unilaterally, unilaterally set it aside and the Nazified legal system where uh, the arbitrary power of the Gestapo not only upended the legal system, but politicized it. And that led to the book that he wrote from late 1936 to uh, 1938, when he, uh, September of 38, when he finished the first draft, his classic book, The Dual State. Uh, and he expressed that theory in terms of the uh, prerogative state and the normative state, I would suggest there's no reason to become anxious about the terms because I've already explained them to you. The prerogative state is the realm of arbitrary power and official violence against which citizens enjoy no legal protection. And the normative state is the legal order, including traditional law and newly enacted Nazi law. What the normative state is not uh, is the rule of law. And I highlight that because there are people who have misused Frankel's concept for exactly that point. The rule of law is the use of general uh, prior laws uh, to govern future behavior in which people are equal before the law and the laws are enforced by neutral judges. Uh, that is not the normative state. The normative state was a state of inequality and uh, a, a state which included uh, prior law, which was reinterpreted during the Nazi era through a Nazi lens and of new Nazi law. And another critical aspect of Frankel's theory of the dual state is that it was not static, but a dynamic interplay between the prerogative state and the normative state. With uh, the arbitrary power of the prerogative state leading the way, and the Nazifying legal system of the normative state playing catch up. The prerogative state reshaped the normative state in its image, transforming the whole legal political system. Uh, I've argued in my book that uh, Frankel's book, The Dual State, was in fact an act of resistance. 
Um, it was an act of resistance at a time when the issue arose in a very pressing way, whether any resistance against the Nazi regime was any longer possible. Uh, Frankel saw that resistance groups had been crushed, that the workers, to his utter disappointment, had been co-opted. He lost the hopes that he had had in late 1935 in his essay, The Point of Illegal Work. Uh, he lost the hope of uh, social democrats being able to carry a resistance on his own. Um, and the book, The Dual State, turned into not only an analysis of the Nazi legal political system, but also a theory of resistance. He raised a theory of resistance based upon natural law, which I'm not going to go into detail now, but involves legal authority beyond statutes, and which he argued could become the basis of a unified resistance and a diverse resistance. Uh, whether or not one would consider Frankel's book as an act, his writing of his book as an act of resistance, uh, he uh, certainly wrote it at a time when he continued to represent clients in court um, and continued that form of legal resistance at a time when he used his analysis uh, to uh, guide his representation, when he tried to get clients, uh, to keep clients in court and to keep them away from the prerogative state, the arbitrary power of the Gestapo, meaning trying to keep them in prison rather than being thrown in a concentration camp. Um, and at the same time that uh, he was writing uh, the dual state, he continued to be active in acts of resistance. He helped uh, the uh, uh, one remaining, one of the few remaining German resistance group. Uh, he copied over uh, pamphlets for that group. Uh, he did this for several months. And his activity in that regard is what I have discovered led to the ultimate attempt to arrest him on September 20 of 1938. The group had just been broken in part by the discovery of one of the uh, pamphlets that Frankel had uh, copied over. Um, and um, he was warned in a telephone call um, uh, um, that he was about to be arrested. He left that day uh, first for England and ultimately for the uh, United States. Uh, I have plenty more I could say. Uh, about um, uh, to answer the questions of how Frankel was able to do it. I'm looking at the clock. Uh, so I will say that uh, in short, uh, he uh, recoiled before two bar that other jer lawyers and other even Jewish lawyers recoiled before two barriers that Frankel defied. Uh, he defied mortality uh, in believing that the resistance uh, needed uh, people who would put their lives on the line and there was no other way to resist the Nazi regime. And he also defied a, a rigid view of what German professionalism uh, is. Uh, he was able to, to keep a distance from his uh, professional role as a lawyer because he also had an underlying political or orientation, maybe even ideology as a Marxist and a social uh, Democrat. Um, he, uh, his theory of the dual state, uh, in my view, originated in the psychology of an intellectual who is confronting the experience of a socialist and of a Jew practicing law in Nazi Germany. Uh, he developed this theory while he was a lawyer for victims of the Nazi regime, while he was actively engaged in the anti-Nazi resistance, and while he studied and was a scholar of the oppressor. Uh, and with that, I would like to turn it on, over to my uh, friend, my colleague, and uh, my cross-examiner, Claudia Kunz. Oh, no. Hi, everybody. I don't feel like a cross-examiner. I think what I'm going to do is to uh, open up with some appreciation of this book and to ask some critical questions, not only of Doug, but of all of us, because after all, we're living in an age when we're asking questions about the regime we live under, lots of them.
And let me though first start by saying how much I appreciated the frame of the book, that the book opens with Floristan, Infidelio, dramatic hero. Huh. No, Franco wasn't like that. In German, they have a word for that, Selbstmordkandidat, candidate for, self, uh, for uh, suicidal. Then he closes the book with Socrates and Crito, and Socrates refused to flee. He absolutely obeyed the law, no matter what. Uh, that wasn't Frankel either. Frankel was in between, in that murky area in between. He remained in Germany. He didn't defend communists. That was too dangerous. If somebody needed to buy a mimeograph machine, he went and bought the mimeograph machine. He found a middle way in between the extremes, but he always had an escape hatch in the back of his mind. It, not everybody, when they get a word that they're, they're about to be arrested by the Gestapo, not everyone has an exit plan. So I think this is uh, really a, a, a great way of finding quiet courage in an intellectual, try, using his skills to help us and to help outsiders understand. And as I read, I couldn't help but think of two others. Of course, one of the others was, uh, was Frankel, it was uh, Neumann. And so we, as we know from reading Doug's book, the, the, for, for, sorry, for Frankel, the state was a dual state, paired legal systems. And, but for Franz Neumann, behemoth, although the title, subtitle was Structure and Practice, actually think of what a behemoth is in the book of Job. This voracious monster, as lawless as it is secure, it is a terrifying, not a monolith, a behemoth. And as I was reading, uh, reading about these two intellectuals, I was thinking, of course, of two other secular Jews, one of whom was Raphael Lemkin, who wrote Axis Rule in Occupied Europe as a way of analyzing Nazi overseas uh, hegemony. And then, of course, Victor Klemperer, who used his talents as a literary analysis and analyst to understand how the language of the Third Reich seeps into the consciousness of Germans around him. So here we have, oh, and incidentally, I'm not suggesting that you write another book, Doug. It was fine to leave out the two of them. It was, it was enough that you wrote broadly enough so that I, as a reader, thought, oh, there's Lemkin, there's Klemperer, two other heroes, uh, intellectual hero, heroes. Um, one of the things that I liked about Frankel also, and I thought you did this so well, is to pair Frankel with other actual people. And I'm thinking here of your comparison with um, Hermann Brill, who started this sort of ephemeral folks front, and then uh, Gauger, who both of, both of whom died, both of whom were arrested. And I would say Brill was naive in thinking how much uh, he could defy the law. And Gauger what seems to me is seduced by the right wing of the, of the Big Canada Kirche above the uh, dissenting church. And so here was Frankel between two non-Jewish alternatives because both of these men, I think, must have felt a kind of entitlement that Frankel couldn't, have felt, couldn't afford to feel. And that his being Jewish, of course, secular, his being Jewish sharpened his sense of danger. And I thought that was really interesting too. Um, now, I've got a question about the conclusion. Why did you add the triple state? I thought the whole book did such a good job of talking about the dual state. And then finally, there in the conclusion, you dropped in the triple state. Why do we need a triple state? Okay, I'll leave that one out for discussion. And then the other one, of course, the conscience. All the way throughout the book, I just kept thinking, oh, that conscience is so wonderful. It's like a rock. It's like, did you remember that, what was it, Kant who said this conscience, what was that? It was the stable core between the starry heavens above and the moral law within, as if we have an innate conscience, and we don't. It isn't a law. Uh, and I thought that the, your discussion, uh, Doug, of absolute moral va values 
Oops, that's, that's my timer. Okay, for Jehovah's Witnesses, sure. Jehovah's Witnesses resisted because they didn't sign to, uh, to any state. So I'd like to just conclude by asking all of us, don't we identify a little bit with Frankel? We read about Curtis Flowers in Mississippi. If you wanna to listen to a horrifying podcast, listen to In the Dark, Curtis Flowers, 21 years in Parchment Prison and six trials and the, they still, well, now he's finally out. Then think too about, uh, about Anthony, Roy, Anthony Ray Hinton, 24 years in jail. And here again, the lawyers prosecuting these two innocent men were operating with <clears throat> healthy popular feeling, that is racism, that kept these victims in jail. And then most recently, Guantanamo, Mohamedou Orid Salafi is now going to be the star of a, his story is going to be the star of the Mauritanian. So what is the source of our conscience in this day and age? What can we do? What can we learn about how to make our decisions in the world we're living in? And I think that's a, a good opening into a further discussion. So I'll stop now and leave the rest of my questions for later. It, David, take it away. Okay, thank you very much. So I'm not going to be able to match the deep psychological and ethical insights that Doug and Claudia have provided. I'm going to uh, instead address uh, three points. Um, first, the question of legality and legitimacy and how after 1945, this looked to some of the participants. Uh, then I will uh, look briefly at the uh, question of the normative state and the prerogative state. And then finally close with a couple of remarks comparing uh, Frankel and his uh, colleague and sometimes good friend uh, Neumann. Uh, first, however, I, I, I want to say that um, like Ernst Frankel, like Michael Sfarad of Yesh Din and Peace Now in Israel, uh, working in the occupied territories, uh, Doug Morris, in the federal court in Brooklyn, test the possibilities of liberal lawyering in illiberal, if not dictatorial settings. I'm not comparing the three uh, venues, but uh, rather uh, Doug's uh, inclination perhaps to uh, look at them. Uh, the system is loaded. Uh, in any event, you gain some victories. Um, for clients while maybe legitimating the system itself uh, and harboring a personal spirit of illegality, uh, as Doug points out uh, more than once, a system of a personal spirit of illegality and testing the boundaries of the possible. Uh, as to the first question, what is the source of legitimacy uh, for law? Um, Frankel came to be a supporter of natural law, of a particular version of natural law. His colleague and friend Franz Neumann was mostly in the opposite camp of positivists. Now, why does this matter? Uh, because after the Nazi nightmare, German reformers, Catholics like Gustav Radbruch in particular, blame that stiff Prussianism, that by the book literalism for the failure of lawyers and courts to resist. They didn't challenge the law. Uh, that was their problem. Uh, they followed the statutes. Uh, Radbruch and those who uh, followed uh, turned to natural or God-given law as a break on that for the future Bundesrepublik for a break on that kind of Prussian statutory positivism. And that's their influence is evident now in the German constitution's starting point, which is the principle of human dignity, uh, itself a very natural rights, Catholic inflected uh, starting point for a legal system. Frankel believed that natural law with its abstract norms could be op an oppositional tool, a morally strong tool for resistance and a basis for political alliances. He followed a religious tradition from Aquinas to Trolch, which I find odd for a totally non-religious Jew married to a non-religious Christian woman. 
Frankel's rational natural law can be heard in many voices across the political spectrum. Martin Luther King, of course, uh, juxtaposed it to the Southern Jim Crow regime. But we also find that natural law uh, uh, perspective at Notre Dame University and in the voice of Clarence Thomas and in the voice of our newest uh, Supreme Court Justice. Franz Neumann, in contrast, saw democratic rule, not God or nature as the source of the law. The problem, of course, is what happens uh, when democratic rule and parliamentarism uh, produce uh, the wrong results. Uh, what can we turn to as a break on that? And Doug has an excellent discussion of that in his book on pages 184 to 190, which I recommend uh, to those uh, who have the book already and to many of those of you who will want to get your hands on the book uh, after today. Uh, the second uh, question to which I turn briefly is the coexistence of the prerogative state and the normative state with special courts and people's courts in between. Besides its arbitrariness, the great power of the prerogative state is that it decided on jurisdiction over jurisdiction. I don't want to get too technical here uh, as a legal scholar, but the question of where your case is going, by whom your case will be heard, is halfway there in deciding what the outcome will be. It was the Nazi institutions that decided if a particular matter would go to a normal court where Frankel might be able to do something to help or to a special court and according to which processes a decision would be made. Capitalist relations in Nazi Germany needed both violence against its enemies, social Democrats, Judeo-Bolsheviks and the like, but it also needed law for running businesses. Contracts have to be reliable. Property is sold. People get divorced. Car accidents happen. Predictability is needed. And so uh, one extreme example, uh, though a true to life one, is, and we have to remember that this is pre-1938. One individual sent to a concentration camp for political punishment, open-ended, no opportunity to defend himself. Even though he was in a concentration camp, is on record as having been able to file a successful appeal of the local tax assessor's evaluation of the taxes he owed, right? This is, um, the juxtaposition of the of Vilcor of Nazi arbitrariness with the normal operation necessary for a capitalist economy and a residual rule of law, a residual normative system. Thirdly, uh, Frankel versus Neumann, uh, as as you know. I've read two books uh, recently about Frankel. Uh, one, of course, Douglas's, and the other by uh, Meyer Henrich. And Douglas paints a picture of, of two colleagues, friends who saw some things differently. Meyer Henrich, in contrast, um, even though his book is about Frankel, spends the first 80 pages attacking Neumann, something which I must say got under my skin. But there are there's an important difference to remember um, in these uh, differences between friends. Uh, Frankel fled Germany very shortly before Kristallnacht in 1938. That said, his argument as to the dual state does claim that there was a real, if ugly, state one in which, as Doug writes on page 41, the normative state regularly deferred to the prerogative state, but persisted. Neumann, on the other hand, writing of three, the first edition at least, Behemoth, three years later, the second more uh, extensive edition two years after that, described the Nazi regime more accurately, I think, uh, as resting on four pillars, uh, party, state, army, and big capital. It was a non-state with no real law and no real national, excuse me, no real rationality, only decisionism 
It had procedures, but it had no structure of rights. And it was a, a Schmidtian. I mean, I don't want to get uh, distracted here with the discussion of Schmidt, but it was decisionism. It had procedures, but without a structure of rights. And for Neumann, that means that the Nazi regime was more a mafia gang than a state. It was a position, I might say, which has been advanced even in recent years by Hans Mommsen and other uh, very distinguished and well-informed scholars. Um, I mean, obviously to the victims of that regime, let's call it a regime, um, it, it hardly mattered whether um, it functioned as a, uh, as a normal state. Neumann in that sense probably uh, was a little too um, uh, Weberian or a little bit too, uh, Brit had certain British influence after he left Germany. Um, the standards for what constitutes a state growing out of a, a, uh, a, a clearly articulated set of rights and responsibilities that citizens have in a constitutional parliamentary regime, that certainly uh, by that measure, the Nazi state fails. Uh, on the other hand, if the state is um, uh, organ that in, in kind of Tilly-esque fashion, Charles Tilly-esque fashion, uh, successfully asserts a monopoly on violence over a given territory and people, then there's no question that Frankel is closer to the mark. The state functioned both in its long-term ambitions and in its everyday need to manage its population and their custodian problems. So I will stop there and uh, turn the floor uh, uh, back uh, to Doug, who can take issue, uh, rather than my posing a concrete question, I'll let him take issue with anything that I just said. Well, thank you, uh, Claudia and David. Um, I, I'm not gonna take issue. I, I just wanted to maybe point to uh, some commonality of parts of what both Claudia and David said. Uh, in terms of the issue of conscience, uh, which arises often in uh, when studying the issue of resistors in Nazi Germany. Uh, and I've argued in my book that uh, it was critical for people to get their bearings, especially in a circumstance and a state and a transformed society in which uh, belonging to the group was essential. Uh, being excluded from the group was a form of shaming people. And when someone was an outsider, either by legal definition, such as Jews, or by choice, such as resistors, uh, they had to fall back on something other than an idea of uh, the community, which formed the uh, Nazi idea of the group at the time. And what they fell back on uh, and needed to fall back on was conscience. Um, and they needed to fall back on that because they resistors were isolated um, and they had to have some kind of source of courage. Now, I might have uh, begged the question in a way uh, because uh, I haven't answered uh, what uh, Claudia has drawn into question, what uh, conscience is or whether it even exists. Um, although uh, her remarks uh, made me think about uh, the issue of uh, Martin Gauger, who tried to derive his conscience from his religious beliefs. And in fact, uh, what carried Martin Gauger, this uh, resistor who was a uh, part of the confessing church, and of the, uh, in fact, the right wing part of the confessing church, uh, what carried him uh, through was his sense of conscience derived from those religious beliefs. Um, for uh, Frankel, I think that he had a source of conscience uh, in uh, his political views and ideas in uh, what he would think theoretically was uh, Marxism, uh, what was uh, certainly his uh, social democratic views, uh, so that he saw a source there. That connects with what David said insofar as that conscience uh, has a connection to the idea of natural law, an idea of there being some kind of law, standards, rules, principles that people can draw on that are outside of standards. Again, it might beg the question, what is the source of uh, those uh, standards and rules? 
and uh, Frankel struggled with uh, that issue. Uh, he used it um, as a way of arguing uh, in favor of uh, resistance and thinking about how to unify resistance. And in that regard, uh, I think there was some commonality between uh, Frankel and uh, Neumann. Uh, Neumann did come around to the idea that there should be natural law, uh, that it had a role to play in uh, justifying uh, resistance. Uh, that's what he struggled with. He struggled with it later uh, after the war when he was thinking back um, about uh, how to resist um, any regime, not just the uh, Nazi regime. At that time, he was also thinking in terms of the new states um, and uh, uh, what such as the Soviet Union, that, um, uh, that the role that they were playing in the uh, uh, post-war uh, world. Uh, I think what Frankel and Neumann had in common in thinking about natural law was that although they saw it as a source of resistance, they also recognized uh, that natural law was much more often used as a way to justify uh, powers that had already uh, uh, had taken control um, and uh, was more effectively maybe used by the right wing uh, than on the rare occasions that it was used as a source uh, for resistance or for re revolutionary uh, ideas. Um, I think that um, the contrast of Neumann's and Frankel's view towards natural law, uh, that, that their view towards natural law, in fact, contrasts with Radbrook's view. Uh, I think that Radbrook uh, got it wrong after World War II in saying that the problem with the judiciary and the uh, justice system in the Nazi era was that they didn't have natural law. That wasn't the problem. The problem was the politics behind the justice system under the Nazi regime and the way that the lawyers and the judges uh, greeted the political innovations of the Nazi regime and certainly didn't resist those uh, innovations uh, the way someone like Frankel did, his very few uh, uh, fellow lawyers and uh, the many, many clients uh, whom he represented. Well, I, I would ask you then, Doug, this one question, um, and it comes back to Rod Brook and the other natural law advocates, this is a kind of anti-democratic position. It's a fear of the democratic mob let loose and judges, justices, particularly those in a position to invalidate laws um, often use this natural law basis as a break on democratic decision-making. So if you think democratic decision-making leads to Nazi takeovers, then you want that kind of elite break on the mob. But if you um, are um, the dominant force in a society, say like our own, then you would favor um, uh, natural law as that break against parliamentary democracy, and you might. There's been a sus there's a suspicion against. Let me phrase this a little differently. There's a suspicion against judicial review and the invocation of natural rights amongst um, mass movements and um, revolutionary movements. To be sure, consistently over the last two or three hundred years. Um, so I, I, it may be out of such utter weakness that Frankel and others turn to a natural rights argument. Well, I mean, my, my thought would be that context is everything. Um, uh, as a uh, good Franz Neumannian, uh, so the, what you pointed to, David, is uh, indeed one of the uh, problems that troubled uh, Neumann at the end of his life. How do I uh, reconcile uh, an idea of natural law as a source of uh, uh, dissent, civil disobedience, and democracy? And the answer that Neumann arrived at is, I can't. I can't reconcile them. There's no logical way to do it. Um, from the point of view of Ernst Frankel, 
during the Nazi regime, uh, I don't think he was thinking at that point in the no late 1930s, between late 1936 and, uh, and, and 1938, I don't think that he was thinking in terms of democracy, he was thinking in terms of how do you uh, uh, resist and do what you can to at least damage, if, I'm not sure at that point he could think in terms of even overthrowing that kind of uh, regime. Uh, so uh, he then, uh, you know, went to the idea of uh, natural law, whether uh, that was the right answer for the time or not. Uh, in fact, I think for the time, there was no right answer. There was a, uh, a people who wanted to resist who were at that point utterly trapped um, and uh, really had no way out of it, unless except for uh, someone like Frankel who was able to um, uh, escape uh, from uh, Germany. Claudia, you. Okay, guys, I'm coming in at a different from a different view. I think no matter what system of law you have, it can be perverted by a smart enough person. It doesn't matter. What is important, what was important, was the Nazi leaders' perception that they needed to be perceived as coherent. And not only in commercial law, not only because people needed marriage license, but Nazi leaders were terrified of corruption, terrified of disagree, this, of, of disobedience. So they needed a sheen of, of legitimacy. And just within the first year of after the takeover, over two dozen pamphlets were published guiding lawmakers, guiding judges, racial political law by Nikolai is one German. Another one, the, the, the desire for uniform racial categories, Nordic, German, Aryan, what is this? The right of the national revolution. Then they were quotations from Hitler. What are we going to do? We're going to listen to Hitler's words. That's our new law. What are they? They were all different. It was chaos. And the Nazis couldn't deal with chaos. So they needed a sheen, an image of lawfulness to keep people obedient, even loyal subjects. So I think that we should just remember that a lot of what we're talking about is the appearance of legitimacy. And I should also add that the, that the uh, physical appearance of these handbooks looked exactly like the, the regular boring titles of the Weimar equivalents. I would just say, Claudia, that's uh, all. Uh, that's very interesting, and I think that it actually uh, supports Frankel's analysis of the nature too. of the dual state. Yeah. Yes. The dual state uh, was a form of governing and control, uh, which relied not just on raw political power. It relied on right. that, right. and it certainly benefited and used uh, violent intimidation, but it also wanted to leverage the uh, appear, apparent legitimacy of courts. And it's for that reason that it would uh, want to uh, ha have the prerogative state bring the normative state along. It's for that reason that it would wanna have pamphlets in order to express clearly what the uh, political expectations uh, were of the uh, ruling powers uh, to impose uh, forces to uh, produce a consistency which would create the appearance of legitimacy. Um, I would be interested in seeing the pamphlets that you relate to what, uh, what, and what you've told us about. What they bring to mind also are the letters from the uh, uh, Ministry of Justice during World War II, which specifically instructed judges as to what decisions they were going to, had to make uh, in, uh, in, against the uh, unfortunate defendants that were brought before them at the time. Again, an example, I think, of the prerogative state of arbitrary power uh, in uh, trying to use the uh, normative state or whatever legal system existed uh, to, as another way of accomplishing their purposes. Well, one very quick comment on this. I mean, very soon after January, uh, uh, the counter-revolutionary revolution is over and you can't sit on your bayonets and, and the street violence has to stop at some point and there has to be some routinization of this Machtherrschaft and um, 
that's done through rules and regulations. I, I you know, which are internalized in the new Volksgemeinschaft culture and ideology. Okay. I think that uh, um, we might be ready for some audience questions. I'm sure all three of us are eager to hear them. Um, yeah, hi, thank you uh, for the, the questions that have, well, first of all, thanks to our panelists for that um, fascinating discussion. And thanks to those of you who've been typing your questions in the chat. So um, we've got a couple that are just sort of factual. Uh, what From Jim Ullman, what happened to Frankel after the war and when he returned to Germany? And um, another person asks, how did he get out of Germany? Douglas? So let me take let me take those uh, questions in opposite order so that they're chronological order. Mm -hmm. uh, Frankel's uh, legal practice uh, was drying up uh, because he could not take as many cases as he had before uh, as the Nazi regime shifted more and more political cases from regular courts in which Frankel could appear into specialized courts, most importantly, the People's Court in which Frankel could not appear. Uh, also, as a Jew, it was uh, more, more and more difficult for him to uh, uh, represent clients. He became uh, an advisor to other lawyers, uh, but his practice was drying up and he realized he had to leave. So he arranged to leave uh, from Nazi Germany in a uh, typically uh, orderly uh, German way. He got his papers in order. He was ready to leave. On the morning of September 20 of 1938, he got a phone call that he was on a Gestapo arrest list. Um, and since he had his papers in order, he was able to get on a flight that uh, evening uh, or that afternoon and fly out of the country. Uh, he flew to England and then on to the United States. Uh, when he arrived in the United States, uh, he improved his English. He translated his book, The Dual State, or helped translate the book, The Dual State, uh, into English. He also translated works of Paul Tillich. He went to the University of Chicago Law School and graduated in two years. In my way of thinking, that's just incredible and amazing. Um, uh, during the uh, war, he was a private attorney and at times worked uh, in the Treasury Department. Uh, for five years after the war, uh, he went to uh, uh, Korea to try to uh, reestablish uh, the uh, government in Korea. Uh, he vowed never to return to Germany, especially after he learned about uh, Auschwitz in the gas chambers, probably around 1943, he learned about that. Uh, but he was invited to teach at the Free University of Berlin. Uh, he went back and he more or less stayed. He thought that he uh, had a kind of mission in terms of trying to educate a new generation of Germans uh, in terms of the uh, nature uh, of a democracy um, and to try to help uh, democracy in uh, Germany take grab. So uh, that's uh, how he got out and that's what he did. He lived the rest of his life then ultimately in uh, Germany where he died. I add something here and that is, I wanted to know more about the women who also must have helped him escape. His sister, for example, Marta, was actually quite prominent in the Dresden Hygienisch Hygiene uh, Museum. She was married to a very important editor. She's the one who left, she went to, to USA. And so I think his sister Marta deserved more credit. And what about his non-Jewish wife, Hannah Pickle Frankel, whose sister lived on and talked about him? I think it's important here, not only to mention in the last chapter, but to discuss in the chronological part of the book, the role of the women close to him, no matter how thin the documentation is. It's worth well, saying something more. I, I, I agree with that. I mean, his wife, uh, he met a, at a uh, social democratic uh, school where he taught in the late 1920s. They married uh, in 1932 before the regime. And I think that there's no doubt that he was able to sustain uh, these traumatic years uh, because his wife was always uh, by his side and always supported him. Um, and there's uh, no doubt, and she stayed by his side for the rest of his life. 
so that kind of support is incredibly important, but as you also uh, mentioned, uh, the uh, documentation beyond the general uh, description, I have not been able to find. Uh, so uh, I think she played a very important role. Uh, he was uh, close to his sister who, as uh, Claudia just mentioned, uh, was a prominent doctor and involved in public health. She left Germany before uh, Ernst Frankel did, and she helped get him the affidavit that was needed uh, in order to uh, emigrate to the United States. So she uh, played a very important role uh, there as well. Um, I think that um, in terms of what I talked about before, the Delatowski case, uh, there was a, a, the case in which uh, Frankel had this so-called epiphany about the dual state. One characteristic of that case, which I didn't mention, uh, but which was really quite uh, dramatic and really struck Frankel, was in the course of the oral argument before the judge, uh, the Gestapo lawyer said, we can do whatever we want on, uh, with the law. And Frankel said, even dissolve a marriage? And the Gestapo lawyer answered, yes. Uh, that really struck Frankel. And I think part of the reason why it struck Frankel, uh, many reasons, but part of it uh, was that on the one hand, he had uh, his wife, who is non-Jewish, who was standing by, by his side. On the other hand, his sister's husband, who was an editor, as Claudia just uh, mentioned, uh, wanted to keep his position as an editor um, and divorced uh, his uh, wife, Frankel's uh, sister. So I think that uh, affected Frankel and, and contributed uh, certainly uh, to his thinking. I also think that in terms of uh, women, uh, women were uh, playing an active role in the resistance. Um, there were one of the uh, trials in which uh, Frankel uh, represented resistance had to do with uh, women in a prison in a town called Yauer, uh, which is about 120 kilometers southeast of Berlin, but a rather small town. Uh, and the prison director who wanted to uh, work his way up uh, decided that the women one night had uh, engaged in a mutiny, 50 of them. Um, on the day of trial, Frankel and two of his non-Jewish uh, lawyer colleagues appeared to uh, represent the women uh, and, uh, to, uh, and represented them effectively. They were acquitted. Uh, so there were women who were in the resistance, uh, and I could give other examples, but uh, maybe I should give time for more questions. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to uh, read a question from Susie, who asks about Max Hirschberg and Hans Litten as, as uh, Jewish lawyers. Weren't they better examples of resistors to the Nazi state than Frankel because they actually went to prison and, of course, ultimately Litten committed suicide in prison? Um, and both of them confronted uh, Hitler in the courtroom. Um, well, I mean, we can decide what standards we use in terms of uh, res resistance. I mean, resistance also, we could give all kinds of definitions. Um, in addition to resistance is the issue of how courageous somebody was or uh, was not. Uh, in terms of uh, Max Hirschberg, who I also admire, my first book was about Max Hirschberg. Uh, he was arrested in March of 1933, and he was kept in a uh, prison in Munich uh, for, um, for uh, about five or six months. He was released, uh, and then eight months later, he left uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, during those eight months, he uh, probably more or less wrapped up his legal practice, but he was not actively, to my knowledge, resisting the regime uh, during uh, the regime itself. He had earlier had a very dramatic case in which he was one of the first lawyers who confronted uh, Adolf Hitler in the courtroom uh, and certainly gave no quarter uh, to uh, Hitler or to the Nazis when he was representing political defendants during the Weimar Republic in Munich, which was the uh, birthplace of the Nazi movement. Uh, so he was uh, undoubtedly a courageous uh, political lawyer and an effective one. My only point is that, and he certainly was arrested when the regime uh, entered uh, Munich in March of 1933. Um, uh, my 
question would be, is that a for, at that point, is he resisting uh, uh, the regime? In for, terms of Hans Litten, another uh, remarkable uh, lawyer in Berlin who came on the scene like a meteor in the early 1930s uh, and confronted the Nazis in court, including in a, uh, a dramatic uh, court appearance uh, in the uh, uh, in a um, in a trial in which he cross-examined Hitler, which Hitler was not very uh, happy about. Um, when the Nazi regime came to power, uh, H H Litten's mother urged him to flee. Uh, Litten refused, uh, saying that he uh, that, com that his communist workers and other workers couldn't flee. He also had to stay put. He was arrested uh, and spent the next uh, five years uh, of his life in a concentration camp um, under horrible uh, circumstances until he committed suicide in February of uh, 1938. Again, was, he was not resisting as a lawyer during the Nazi regime. He was certainly uh, continuing to act courageously uh, and uh, doing what he could within a uh, constant Tracing camps. Uh, the uh, the uh, wonderful biography of Hans Litten in English is by Benjamin Hett, uh, which I would highly recommend and which would describe in detail what he his the second half of the book describes in detail uh, what his uh, his uh, courage while he was uh, in a concentration camps uh, during the Nazi regime. And of course, Hans Litten is a, a character in the most recent season of Babylon Berlin, too, which is kind of a fun uh, detail. Um, I see that Ismar Shorsh uh, has his hand raised, so I'm going to see if we can get him to ask his question on the air, so to speak. Uh, Ismar? Yes. <clears throat> oh. uh, I actually have a simple question. When and where was Frankel able to publish his book? So um, Frankel, as I had said, um, wrote the first draft of the dual state while he was in Nazi Germany. He was able to smuggle out a draft uh, in a diplomatic pouch uh, with a French diplomat. Um, he then uh, rewrote the book while he was in the United States. Uh, and it was published in 1941. Um, and um, uh, I don't remember the publisher, but it was published in 1941, a year before Franz Neumann's uh, book, Behemoth. Uh, so it was, it made quite a, uh, I wouldn't say splash, but it was an important book at the time. It was uh, well reviewed, it was extensively reviewed, uh, well reviewed, ironically, except by a former legal intern of his who uh, gave it a uh, stinging uh, criticism and that was Otto Kirschheim. Uh, so um, that was a, um, another uh, interesting anecdote, I suppose, about uh, the uh, responses of uh, Jewish lawyers uh, who got out of Germany were concerned about uh, what had happened in uh, Nazi Germany and what was happening and what to do about it and engaged in debates, which they thought were incredibly important in terms of why this regime had appeared and what to do about this regime. And that actually goes, and maybe I'm getting a little far afield from the question, but to one of the uh, issues that interested me in terms of Ernst Frankel, uh, as Frank Mecklenburg, uh, who, who introduced us, had once said to me, well, you didn't really need a theory of resistance to um, oppose the Nazi regime. You could just oppose it. It didn't. And that's true. But there were lawyers and uh, and scholars such as Frankel, such as Neumann, such as Kirschheimer, who, 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 who thought in terms of what is happening legally, what is the justification uh, for what we can do uh, about this, uh, this uh, uh, political crisis. Great, um, thanks for the, that question, Ismar. Um, we have another question from Renata Breidenthal um, it, regarding the legitimacy of the state. 
Doesn't the debate then and now mask the conflict of material interests in society? And then she clarifies, the assumption is that law protects persons and property. My question addresses those social relations of power which come into questions at times of economic crisis. I'm gonna hand that to David. Oh, thank you. Well, I mean, on the one hand, um, we know that the rich and poor alike may not sleep under the bridges of Paris. So the, the universality of law is there in part to uh, transform everyone independent of their social, uh, their place in the social relations of production into an equal citizen or uh, appellant or appellee or whatever. Uh, you know, the law is both uh, dependent and independent variable in social relations. Um, uh, Weber used the, the um, metaphor of the switchman that uh, directs material interests down one track or another at critical junctions in the rail yard. And uh, I think it's true. I mean, uh, for Neumann and for Frankel, particularly Frankel in the uh, first draft of the dual state, um, they're, they're, they're serious Marxists. I mean, this is a stage of capitalism threatened by workers' movements. Uh, they have to be put down and they are put down by a combination of violence and as Claudia suggested, a new cultural and ethical system uh, via Volksgemeinschaft and the uh, othering of the Judeo-Bolsheviks. And, um, you know, that's uh, the use of law to uh, build into the concrete or maintain in the concrete a capitalist system in crisis. Uh, that's how they, Neumann saw it at the time. And Frankel, as Doug, will, uh, Doug points out in the book, you know, it's one of the differences between the first draft and the second draft between the German version and the uh, Anglo-American version is a dilution of that Marxist analysis, which leads to a further question. I'm not trying to uh, dodge your question, Renata, but the Cold War was very bad for Frankel and Neumann and lots of others as they got caught up in the anti-totalitarianism, i.e. anti-Sovietism of the post-war years. And Frankel in, at the Free University is no longer that same man. Uh, he uh, becomes a defender of liberal pluralism. Um, and um, Neumann, of course, dies terribly young in the mid 50s in a car accident. Uh, so we don't know which way he would have gone. Kerkheimer also you know, becomes something of a left liberal pluralist. So, you know, the post war arena, capitalism triumphs, the Soviet. Uh, the communist uh, alternative is not one that appeals to them. And um, there's a de-radicalization of their thought, uh, of their thinking. So, um, you know, the, the legal analysis is embedded in a political analysis. And that political analysis, in turn, is part of a social struggle with winners and losers in the anti-fascist coalition, which we then saw reflected in the politics of several West European countries between 1945 and 1947 is extruded and gone. Uh, these guys would all have made great popular front uh, players, but it's over. <clears throat> I, think, I think we have time for one or two more questions. So here's one from, uh, from Jean. I am interested in the theoretical origins of his ideas on natural law. What did he owe to 17th century English writers, to Kant, to Rousseau? Well, in um, his thinking about natural law, uh, he does refer to Kant and he uh, maybe refers to Rousseau, but the person that really influenced him was Ernst Trolch, uh, who is a Christian theologian, uh, uh, kind of, left uh, humanist Christian theologian. Uh, and he, uh, th that's where he got his idea about natural law and about natural law as a source of resistance. Uh, what he uh, thought was that natural law fell into two 
uh, types of natural law, uh, relative natural law, relativistic natural law, and absolute, absolutist uh, natural law. But the relativistic natural law was a natural law which adjusted to uh, economic and social circumstances, uh, the Catholic Church during the uh, Middle Ages um, and, uh, um, and Luther to some extent uh, when he came on the uh, scene, uh, he thought that the, uh, the contribution of that um, during the Nazi regime was limited but existed. And the form that it existed in, uh, he, he thought it was limited because it uh, provided a way for the uh, uh, churches, both the Protestant and the Catholic Church, to accommodate to the Nazi regime. But the form that uh, gave some hope for resistance was what we had been talking about before, was the issue of conscience, which Claudia has uh, studied so deeply uh, in her book, The Nazi Conscience, in relation to, uh, in relation to the uh, Nazi regime. The other kind of natural law was absolutist uh, natural law, which uh, Frankel saw in the uh, Reformation in the various uh, rather absolutist type sects that appeared. Uh, and he thought that that reappeared in the Nazi regime uh, in the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, who he found were uh, just utterly sturdy uh, in their opposition to the regime and unforgiving in their opposition to the regime and to that extent provided one among maybe others, but one significant model of rising up against tyranny uh, based upon that kind of idea of an absolutist uh, natural law. So Frankel's ideas of natural law uh, were keyed to the immediate uh, political crisis that he was facing and derived uh, uh, most importantly from the thinking of Ernst Kroll. Can I just jump in and remind everybody that the only people in concentration camps who the, who the, uh, the Nazis trusted to shave them were the Jehovah's Witnesses. Because the Jehovah's Witnesses had an absolute standard, they would not kill, not even in Nazi. So there's some ambiguity there too. Great. Well, um, we're getting close to the allotted time um, for today. And I, so I just want to, um, Douglas, if you have any closing thoughts, I think now would be the time to share them. And perhaps, uh, I'm not sure if this is where, you, where you'd want to end, but I mean, perhaps something about the relevance of Ernst Frankel's thought um, uh, today. Uh, well, um, I wasn't expecting to give a closing thought, but I will. Um, I think that uh, Ernst Frankel's idea of the dual state uh, may well be a way to uh, understand authoritarian governments today. And I know that there are scholars out there who are exploring that in terms of uh, trying to uh, see how his ideas help to understand authoritarian uh, states. When Frankel came up with the idea, he was very clear. He was thinking about Nazi Germany. He was not thinking about a more uh, a wider uh, political uh, theory. That's not to say that it might not be rich enough to expand. Um, but I would also add that the uh, flip side of his theory of the dual state is the rule of law. Uh, and I think that the rule of law is incredibly important. Um, when people ask the question, what are the lessons uh, to learn from history, for example, I think, sure, there are a lot of lessons to learn from history. That's one of the reasons that we all um, uh, study history. Uh, one of the problems is trying to find one-on-one -one correspondences, which usually don't work as well. Um, but uh, a, a concept such as the rule of law, I think really does provide a framework uh, for evaluating uh, what is happening in the contemporary world and contemporary politics um, and for uh, using as a contrast and a foil uh, to when things go terribly wrong and terribly awry, such as uh, during, the, uh, during the Nazi regime. I think that one of the problems in uh, present uh, debate about the use of history, about politics, obviously, in, in this country recently, is that although there has been uh, uh, regular reference 
uh, to the rule of law, I think that it is not fleshed out as much as it should be. And I think it uh, really should be. And uh, so one of the uh, concepts that I have gotten from studying the Weimar Republic, from studying Nazi Germany, from studying Max Hirschberg, but from studying Ernst Frankel is this concept of the rule of law. Great. Well, um, Douglas, thank you so much. Claudia, David, uh, we really appreciate your um, thoughtful contributions. And, and Douglas, we appreciate your book. And thanks to everyone for tuning in.